So I'm flying solo today. We'll get back with Kelly on the next episode. Today, I have a special guest, an author, LPGA Tour professional, Chris Shetter. She had the opportunity to get to know Ben Hogan while a college golfer at TCU. She was a junior member at Shady Oaks Golf Club and wrote the book, Mr. Hogan, The Man I Knew. It's a really fun read. Most of us know Ben Hogan through all the different instructional books written about him, his commitment to practice, his perfectionism. And this book really provides you a different look at the man uh, very few people got to see. Also, Chris has informed me that all books purchased using the link in the description in this video will be signed by her. So that there's an opportunity to get a signed book. It's a really fun read. I hope you enjoy the interview. Episode two of the Golf Simcast, Chris Cheddar. Uh, your book is amazing. I Oh, thank you. Well, what's fun about it is I think, and what, what is kind of sad is the farther we get away from that period of golf, the more you lose that history. Like for me, I don't know anything about Bobby Jones. You know, I don't yeah. know anything about the demerit or, you know, you hear these names thrown around and it's like, that just kind of too early for me. Uh, that's how I was when I met Mr. Hogan. Uh, well, why don't you share the story of how you got to Shady Oaks? Cause that's a great story. Oh, well, um, the story about the gun. Yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, it's yeah. just, it, I think it's, it's it it's makes so sense crazy. because you seem like someone who says yes to a lot of things and you're happy to meet people. You know, I was reading that in the book and I'm messaging you on Twitter and I'm like, she's exactly like she says she is in the book. Cause it's like, you're like, yeah, whatever. It sounds great. Let's do it. And so boy, go ahead. So, um, well, both my brother and I were going to school at TCU and they didn't have great practice facilities. None of the courses, I think like only one of the courses we played actually had a range. So we would always go practice at this park and hit our own balls, which I actually really liked doing. Um, but one day I was out there and all of a sudden this woman, I swear to God, she just appeared out of nowhere. And she's like, excuse me, um, I don't mean to bother you, but do you have a gun? And I was like, uh, uh, no. And, and, you know, she gives me this story about that this guy's been following her. She points out this truck and, and, and I just totally believe it, which it must have been true. I mean, I end, so I ended up saying to her, well, here, jump in my car. I'll take you wherever you need to go. And so I did that and dropped her off and everything was fine. But when I was telling my brother later that night, he was like, oh, my God, you are so dumb, basically. And I'm like, what? And he goes, didn't you think that it might be a setup? And of course, I'm like, no. <laughs> you're from the midwest right and you're not, you i'm don't from have the midwest those, yeah exactly. you don't have those ideas yeah so he, and then immediately he was like you gotta tell dad that story and i'm still like one one step behind you know still not getting it and then when i told my dad the story he's like that's it we're getting you those memberships at, at shady oaks let's back up a second and say you were sounds like a, a pretty heavily recruited high school golfer uh, yeah, I guess. Because because um, you went to TCU, which just won the national championship, but you would imagine that they would have pretty good pick of who they'd want to come to play at their college. Well, what they had going for them was that my brother was already there. And so that was a really big pull for me. I looked at other schools, but we were really close and and I really wanted to go to school where he was. So that was the main reason I ended up there. And so you get there and you're practicing and you get to Shady Oaks, uh, which it sounds like was not necessarily an easy place to be a member at, but maybe there were some connections that you were able well, to get into. They, my brother, before this incident happened, had found out that Shady Oaks was looking for junior members. They were actually kind of trying to get some junior members. Um, and it was cheap. It was like $750 initiation fee. And you could be a junior member until you were 35. Now there was, you still had to pay the dues and such. So that was, you know, it was nice of our parents to, to agree to letting us do this. But the hard part was actually getting another member to sponsor you and, and, and getting in the club. 
So, but my dad knew some people who knew some people and, and next thing we know, we, we both got junior memberships at Shady Oaks. That's awesome. So, so you're walking in the door. Um, well, before I ask you this, now you got an interesting background because you, uh, you were diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and you want yeah. to share with people about that. Cause it's kind of a big part of the story, kind of something you battled your whole professional career. It sounds like. Yeah. So it, it's just, um, people with, uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome are real loose jointed, real, real lax. And so, people are like, Oh, that's great. You're flexible. Except that I was super, super flexible and, and really injury prone. That that's the negative of it is it's just really injury prone. Yeah. So in, in the book, you talk a lot about dislocating your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. I just, my shoulder started popping out when I was like 17. Um, and I was able to, you know, kind of manage it. But then when I got on tour, it, it just playing week in week out was just too much for my body. And uh, I had a lot of problems my first year on tour. So after my first year, I went to a bunch of doctors and the consensus was I needed to get total reconstruction on both shoulders. And fortunately for me, a doctor actually in the practice, it was, it was Dr. Job out in LA, his partner kind of had worked with the tour a little bit. And he pulled me aside and he was like, this is not a guarantee for you. You could get this done and you could spend nine months rehabbing and it will probably just stretch out again. That's how lax you are. And, and then somebody gave me the name of a physical therapist out in Las Vegas and, and that was kind of funny because when I told my dad, I, I do like to gamble. And when I told my dad, so I heard about this physical therapist out in Las Vegas, you know, he's supposed to be the, or no, I said, I heard about this physical therapist who's supposed to be the best. My dad's like, okay, where is it? And I said, Las Vegas. He goes, yeah, right. You need to go to Las Vegas for physical therapy. Sounds but, like another scam, right? Another... Yeah, Exactly. But it it saved my career. I mean, I I got on this shoulder exercises regime that I did religiously my whole career. And did you have, never now have you surgery. had any total joint surgeries done? I have both of my hips. I had okay. I had five orthoscopic surgeries, and then both of my hips have been replaced. And was, when was that? Is that later on or was that later on? Prime? Yeah, okay. it was 2008 and 2009. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so you're, uh, you've, you're, you've moved down to Texas. You've joined your brother at TCU. Is this your freshman year at TCU that all this is happening? Yeah. And you, and you become a member at Shady Oaks at that time. Did you, when did you find out that Mr. Hogan was a member there? I think we knew that going in, it was kind of like, oh, this is where Mr. Hogan's a member. And, and, and I was sort of like in awe because everybody else was in awe. To me, he was like, I, he made clubs. I, I, I knew that he had played and he was really good. Um, but to me, it was like, I played his clubs. Oh, you had, you had his clubs prior to going to Shady Oaks? I did. That yeah. probably helped. That was, that was key probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. When I was, I think I was 14 when I got my first set of new clubs and, and I chose Hogan. So, so that was lucky. Yeah. And was there a reason you chose him or is that just the ones that felt right in your hand at the time? Um, my, the pro at my club was, uh, like Togans, but he had, you know, he had all of the different sets. And I remember kind of looking at everything and, and just thinking they were the prettiest clubs. <laughs> They're beautiful. Yeah. But his clubs were, I mean, when you read about who he was, it makes sense that they're going to be as, as good as you could possibly try to make him with the knowledge they had back then. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was a perfectionist. Yeah. So you're there now. Did you, did you read up on him? Did you, learn you know more about him? Did you just say, I'm just going to talk to him, whatever? I didn't. And the reason I know that is when I was writing the book 
it was so funny because I really, I didn't, I was nervous about writing the book because I felt like I didn't have enough content because I didn't remember a lot. You know, I would spend time with him every day. And so it doesn't, it doesn't really stick out in your brain when it happens every day. And I found a journal of just a few things that I had written down. And I didn't even remember ever writing stuff down. I actually found this journal and was like, oh, I wrote a few things down. How great. Um, and the other thing I did was I talked to people that I talked to at the time that I might just in passing tell them a Hogan story. And then they told them back to me to help me remember. That's how I, I you know, like got a lot of the memories to write the book. Um, but anyways, I found this journal and in the journal, I wrote something and it was like five years after I knew him. And I wrote something like, so I had one of my Monday lunches with Mr. Hogan and I asked him about, you know, I told him I was reading the book, Follow the Sun. And I asked him about, you know, such and such and, you know, this, that and that other tournament. And I was like, oh, my God, I knew him for five years before I finally read something about him. <laughs> But that was well, there's just... been more books written about him and his secrets and yeah. this, that. I mean, I purchased three of them. I mean, I, I was exposed to him when I was trying to, I bought his book, Five Lessons, right? Everyone's written yeah. a book. And I had read that. Well, and what's fascinating about it, I think it gives you like the summary of him somewhat. Yeah. Because you're reading this and I'm thinking, okay, he's going to talk about the short game. Then he's going to talk about course management. He's going to talk about, you know, just golf in general. And then you find out it's the most minute detail of every aspect of yes. grabbing a club and swinging the club and the drawings in it. And it was just like, yeah, oh my gosh. And I think with golf, it's interesting. The more you do it, you learn in layers. It's like an onion. It's funny how you hear certain things and it isn't until you're good enough to hear it and understand what it means. Yeah, there, there are still times where I'll say something, you know, I'll be talking to someone who really understands golf for the golf swing. And I'll say, you know, Mr. Hogan would say this and they're like, oh, I think he meant because a lot of times he would say things and I wouldn't I just didn't have the golf knowledge to really understand the magnitude of the situation. Um, and and. I think other people would have probably asked different questions and asked, you know, more golf specific questions than I did because I didn't really care. I cared about my golf swing and my golf game and I had no other agenda whatsoever, which is probably why he let me in because I clearly had no agenda. I was thinking about that too. And I think, like in a lot of times in life, when you become a mentor to somebody, it's not until you realize how serious they are before you really want to invest the time. Yeah. And he probably saw in you, like you talked about how you love practicing. He, of course, loved practicing. I despise practicing. <laughs> really? One of the reasons why I struggle <laughs> with, uh, with my game, because I just don't, I've never liked practice. I want to go to the, I mean, literally when I go play in the summer, I hit three putts and then you want to get on the a five course. iron five times. Well, that's not all bad. I mean, it's great to get on a course and hit shots because there's nothing like it that you can't simulate it on the range. So. Yeah. But you could do this all day long. Yeah. I loved to that's practice. I'm, I'm very curious about this, the, how this started. I think you, in the book you referenced, you just said hi to him a couple of times. Yeah. So, and I, I don't have, I mean, I have a couple of clear memories, but again, uh, it was, it happened every day. I remember the very first time that he stopped and actually gave me some advice, which was when I was chipping and, you know, he had me really weaken my grip. And basically he was just trying to get me to try different things, um, and I remember the first time my brother and I saw him, like we would see people, older men, and we'd be like, is that Mr. Hogan? Like, we didn't know what he looked like. And then 
when we saw him, it was like, oh, well, it's obvious now that that's him. What what made it obvious? Just just him, just the way he carried himself, the way he he walked, um, the way everybody almost gave him his birth. You know, it was just yeah. it was just obvious. And when we first became members out there, they told us, you know, you don't talk to Mr. Hogan. If he wants to talk to you, he will. And that was the, like, the rule. And so at first I would do that. And then it, it just felt so weird because I would say hello to every other man that walked by. And then I would act like I didn't see Mr. Hogan. And finally I was like, okay, I'm just going to be myself. And, you know said hello to him he said hello back and kept walking and and then it just built from there yeah and so how you said every day is this is this seven days a week well when i say every day every day so every day i was out there um which in the first few years we weren't always playing at shady oaks but i would go out there and practice so let's see i met him in the like probably 1983 the very end of 1983 and I was you know probably within a year we had become really close and so every time I was out at Shady Oaks he would come out so I would drive by the men's grill and give him a wave or run in to get a soda or something and just let him know I was there I mean I I I don't think I ever went out to Shady Oaks and didn't let him know I was there. There were times where I was like, oh, I just want to practice. I just want to, you know, but I just, I, part of it was I liked getting him out again because when I. You guys were giving a gift to each other. I yeah, I hope so. Um, when I first became a member at Shady Oaks, he wasn't, he wasn't hitting balls anymore. He would grab a club and three balls and he would go out on the little nine and maybe hit one, maybe not. You know, he just had it in case. Um, and then after a while, and I would say it was probably within a year, like year one to two, um, he started getting his clubs back on the cart and coming out with his shag bag and, and hitting again. And then when he would get tired, he would come back. He'd always drive by me and he'd throw me a little mini Snickers a lot of the time. <laughs> Tell me it was my lunch. Um, and then he'd go hit balls and then he'd come back when he would get tired and, and watch me hit a few more. And, and, you know, we'd go pick him up and go again. And if he stayed out for an hour, that was probably the norm. And then there were a few times where he just stayed for hours um, and we just would, would banter. Like I think about that, the bantering that I would do with him. And then I, you know, laid much later heard stories about how he would stand and hit balls for hours and, and not say a word to anyone. And I just think, I mean, I was saying something after every shot, mine and his. And it had to be really out of the norm for him. Probably if I were to pull one aspect of the book that, that connected something. And of course, again, being I'm 41, so I just don't know. You hear the, uh, the, the lore of Ben Hogan, you hear about the accident and it, his sad story with his father and growing up really poor and caddying. And then you hear about how stern he was when he played. Uh, stern might not be the right word. How, focused is probably the right word. Yeah. And then I think, I don't know, I don't know if you said it in the book or you referenced someone else saying it was about, he needed to be focused when he was trying to make it because he needed money. I mean, he literally well, needed money. What he told me was, I mean, yes, he did need money and, and at least at, at the start, oh, almost right? went broke a couple of times, but he was so interested in a lot of things that he was afraid if he started talking on the golf course, he would get interested in the conversation and it would distract him from, from staying focused on the golf, which I, 
I don't think it would have because he had such a tremendous mind that I think he could have gone back and forth, but he didn't feel like he could. And so that was why he just had to stay focused the whole time. I mean, I, I would be so tired if I tried to do that. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I tend to, when I'm playing competitively, I bounce in and out. Yeah. I just, I, and it actually keeps me relaxed. I'm assuming that's, that's the way keeps you kind of just yeah, loose. That's the way I am. He claimed his, was his happiness, the performance, the, the ability to execute what he wanted to execute. Was it just doing the practice? Was it, what was it? Cause to me, you see people that are so driven to be the best in the world at something. And, and from, you know, maybe removing Tiger Woods from his prime, they would say best ball striker of all time. Yeah. You can't do that with any sort of balance in your life. Well, I think that he really enjoyed the process of it and the trying to get better and better. I remember when he started coming back out and, and hitting balls again, um, there was this one day where he was hitting like drivers and he, he had just hit in five woods and we got up there and they were in a really tight circle. Like I, I couldn't believe it. And I said, that's, you know, that's a pretty tight circle, Mr. Hogan. And he goes, he just looks at me. He's I, I believe I can do better. Just dead serious. And I'm, and I was just thinking, and like, why? You know, but he, yeah. he loved, he loved it. He loved trying to get better. He loved figuring out things. He was a tinkerer. He would always, you know, try this, try that. If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. And, and I think that's one of the things that I really took away from him is, you know, golf, you can't have the same feeling every day because if you do, it's eventually going to be overdone. And so every day he would kind of go out yes. and, and, and find what worked that day. You told, I think in the book, you talk about a nightmare that he had where he would make <laughs> hit, he'd hit 18 fairways, 18 greens, he'd make 17 birdies and then he would wake and, up. Before no, he no, put, he missed. He said he one. missed the last one. Or well, wait a minute. Oh, he wait, missed. let me think about that. Um, yeah. I think you're right. I thought I, he didn't I, have the I opportunity. Before, you're right. I woke up before I, I yeah. was able to make the last putt. Yeah. Yeah. So I want you to share the story of, and, and I, I don't, I'm not superstitious. I'll say the S word. The shanks. <laughs> Tell that story. Cause I literally, if I would have been drinking something, I would have spit it out when he saw it. And with what he said, it was the most hilarious thing I think I've ever read in my life, but share that, well, share that story. Cause that is a yeah, really good story. I was really struggling with the shanks. Like I had them kind of all summer and you know, you know how the shanks go, you're kind of in and out of them. But anyways, I had them again and I never would ask him specifically to come out. I would wave, I'd let him know I was there and then leave it up to him. And so this day I was like, Mr. Hogan, I need you to come out. I am really struggling. I'm shanking it. And he was like, shanking it. I go, yeah, you know, like that low right shot. And he just looked at me. <laughs> He's like, like he had never heard of it. And I, so anyways, I get out there and of course the first couple are good. And then I, I shank the third one and I look at him. He goes, Oh, good God. And I'm yeah. thinking, it, it is funny I how just, you build. I, what did I just show Ben Hogan his first shank? <laughs> that was what was funny about it. Cause I don't know if he was, he was like playing his part <laughs> there of being surprised. I, had, Cause I have a hard time believing he didn't know I what know, that was. Me too. And I, it sounds totally like it, but it, at the time, it seemed to me like he had never seen a shank. And I don't know what the tr wow. truth is, but I think he had, maybe, you know, maybe his mind was that good that he just blocked it out. The other thing you talked about in the book is when he had to go to the British Open after he'd won the Masters and the U.S. Open, but he still had to qualify. Yeah. And were they, was, was it, I mean, clearly the structure wasn't like it is today where you know, you win one event and you get all these exemptions was the, did he only go there one time? I know there's some of those guys that really didn't go because it was such a, it wasn't easy to get over there and yeah. To play. Yeah. Yeah. He, and it was, it was hard for him too, because of, 
his injuries, uh, but it, he just, he wanted to do it one time. He wanted to go and win and, and, you know, it was just one of his goals, I guess. Um, and, and I should know this, but did he, he win did. that open, that yep. British open? Yeah. And he really earned the respect of, of the people over there. So the one, the one thing I think is interesting about him <coughs> is we have this metric now in professional golf called strokes gained, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And through strokes gained, we've been able to work backwards and figure out what the appropriate course management strategies are. Have you, have you, have you gone into the black hole of some of that course management from uh, stats? A little bit, not much, not much. Okay. So, but what's interesting about it is it seems like he figured it out before the, the data yeah. was there. Yeah. Well, can you, can you share some of the insights that Mr. Hogan gave you as a LPG tour player? I mean, it's, it's fascinating as I've read more about it the last couple of years about most people don't understand how hard it is to get at many pins on yeah. tour, especially in yeah. the majors. And well, he was just very specific about, um, you know, hitting your drive in the, in the right spot so that you could get to all the different pins, you know, and even down to sometimes n not hit a drive because you want to have a different iron in rather than, you know, I mean, he, he thought about all that stuff and he was the first one that told me to stand at the green and look back you know, look, look back at the fairway because then you can really see the better places to leave your drive. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to get it in the fairway. Right. But he was trying to get it in specific places and he, you know, he had, I think he had a photographic memory because he, he remembered all of the different idiosyncrasies on golf courses and, and, just knew exactly what he wanted to do. He had a game plan before he ever teed it up. Um, along those same lines of him being uh, ahead of his time, my dad was always telling me, you know, you need to have a routine. You need to have a very specific routine. And I really tried to not have a routine. I, I just I whatever. I didn't think that it was important. And finally, my dad's like, well, why don't you ask Mr. Hogan if he has a routine? So, you know, I go back to Shady Oaks and I ask Mr. Hogan, do you have a routine? And he's like, a routine? What's a routine? And I go, you know, you do the same thing every time. He's like, no, you hit the ball when you're ready. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to tell my dad this. And then I start watching him. And I'm like, oh, my God, he does the exact same thing down to the number of times he moved his feet like it, it, but I don't think that he had any idea he was doing that, but he did. He, and, you know, he said, Oh, you hit the ball when you're ready. He hit it. Same amount of look, same amount of waggles. Like it was precise. I, I know you, you stayed there obviously through college. Did you stay there? How long after college did you kind of stay focused in that area? I lived there until like 1992, 93. And, but then my brothers were still there. So I would go back and, uh, every time I went back, I would, you know, go to Shady Oaks and try to, try to see him. I wasn't around as much when his memory was really failing. Uh, but I could see it. I could see it starting. But the thing that was so interesting with him is he never got mean, you know, he never got e angry. And that I saw at least. And I always thought that was interesting because it felt like as his memory went away, this softer side of him that was really him was what was left. Yeah. It was like, oh, I knew it was an act. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a couple things in the book that kind of got me. The time he came out to Colonial when you were playing in the major, if you want to share that story, because that that's touching when, when people do things that you know are difficult for them, but they yeah. do it for you because that's how much they care. Cause when you saw him, I mean, that's gotta be like, yeah, wow. With, especially at time, 
I have a no, let me ask you, we'll come back to that one. I did want to ask you this before I forget about it. How many times did you go to Shady Oaks to practice and he wasn't there? Cause he, it sounds like he, his Never. routine was the same every <laughs> single day, went into the Ben Hogan company in the morning, showed up at around lunchtime, went to his table, had his lunch. He, he was uh, always there. Was there was never a time he wasn't there unless I was there in the morning. But, you okay. know, if I was there in the morning, I was probably there in the afternoon too. And so he, yeah, same time every day, same table. Yeah. And it's, so the Colonial Golf Course is, is an important one for mm -hmm. both of you, right? Because Hogan had won there. He won that yep. tournament five times. And so they have a wall with all the names on it of winners. And so was it, the, then that was the U.S. Open was there for you guys? And what uh, year was that? 1991. Okay. I'd love for you to share that story because it's, it's pretty so incredible. So the Open was there and, and I was not exempt for that Open. Um, and so my goal at the beginning of the year was to be in the top 30 so I didn't have to qualify which I achieved, which was good because I, you know, I wanted it so badly. It would have, that would have been hard to qualify. <laughs> um, so anyways, I was in the open and, and I, you know, he knew it was going to be out there and we would talk about the course and, and, you know, I'd have him give me his little insights um, about the course and we would just banter like, Oh, are you going to come out and watch? He's like, Oh, of course I'm going to come out and watch. I wouldn't miss it. You know, but I knew that he was not serious. I, I did not expect him to come out, but we would banter back and forth and, you know, just say that I didn't play well the first couple of days. And I went out to shady Oaks and, um, and he helped me a little bit. And then on Saturday, I think I shot like 66. And so I kind of got myself in the game and was a u.s open scoring low scoring record for about 24 hours until beth daniel beat it the next day <laughs> um so on sunday and i heard this from mrs hogan afterwards he said he wasn't going to come out because he didn't want to take anything away from me what were you to start the day you were just a couple yeah, I think strokes I was back in like fifth place something like that um, so I had a, you know, I had a chance. I think I was two back. Um, and I, and when I made the turn, I was still just a couple back and, but then I went bogey double and, you know, shot myself out of it. And he turned to his wife and said, I need to go out there. And she was like, Oh, Ben, no, it's so hot. It was so hot. It was like upper nineties. There were people, um, and she really tried yeah. to talk him out of it because, you know, she just knew what it would what it would be like um but he was adamant he's like no i need to be there for her. she's going to be so disappointed and so he came out and i saw him on 16 as i was walking off the green so you know i went and gave him a hug and you know thanked him for coming and went to 17 and my dad was caddying for me and he was he was trying to convince the guy the the other caddy in the group he's like hey that's Ben Hogan. And, you know, Hogan's, he's got a, not his, not his white cap on. He's got just like a fedora or whatever, you know, hat. And he's got his big glasses. It's actually the picture. Here it is. Oh, you've got uh, it. Let me get in here. <laughs> there you go. There's the yep. picture. Oh, it's amazing. And so, and the guy wouldn't believe him. My dad's like, I'm telling you. And the guy's like, you're crazy. That is not Ben. What would Ben Hogan be doing out here? Because I hadn't really told anyone that I knew him um, because nobody would believe it, first of all. And it, it, when I, when I would say, even say anything about it, people would just look at me like you, you know? And so I just, I really did not say much that about knowing him. Yeah. And so anyways, then he came out and the cat was out of the bag after that. And he snuck away before it got too crazy. Yeah. yeah. Did you have an appreciate, you know, sometimes we have these seasons of our life, you know, you have these different chunks of time that you have these certain people in your life, you have certain things going on. And I think what's really hard to do is appreciate them when they're happening and not knowing that this is going to change and be different at some yeah. point. Did you have us, I mean, you were so young, I, you know, to be so young to have such an incredible experience like yeah. that. 
Did you appreciate it at the time for I, what it was? Did I you... definitely appreciated it, but I didn't have a sense of that it would be over. You know, I mean, I was just, um, I was, I was super grateful for all that he helped me with. And, um, and I think I understood that I, I was very fortunate that he, he let me see that side of him even back then. But I think that's grown as, as I've gotten older and, and moved further away from it. It's, um, yeah, it seems. You appreciate yeah. it. The, it. I think he was really good at keeping his cards to his chest because the chapter that surprised me more than any, not, I guess there was, the, I will say that what's great about this book is each chapter kind of has its own feel to it. And it's such a fun golf read. Sometimes golf books can be overly technical. <laughs> and this is just fun to read. It, it, cause in your head, like, I don't know Shady Oaks at all. I try to look at pictures of it cause I was trying to picture the, the little nine and where you're driving by this big window or this grill big, I'm thinking this big Oak table where he just holds court. Yeah. Obviously he didn't like to hold court, but, um, but the, the chapter where he, you have the sports psychologist come in yeah, and I was like, okay, how is this going to go? I don't think he's going to want to say anything. And he opens up. But that was the way he was. He was very interested in a lot of things and a lot of diverse okay. things. Um, so mm -hmm. that was that was very typical of him. If he was interested in something, you know, he he loved to have conversations with people. He he hated that they always wanted to talk about golf. So now in your Twitter bio, or sorry, I'm sorry, your ex bio, <laughs> we got to be. You got to be yeah. precise. You talk about messaging you if you're having an issue with the yips, which I will say that I putt sometimes extremely well. I don't have like a, you know, I think the yips doesn't have a clean definition. Yeah. I kind of think of it there. I have a friend who actually has a twitch when he putts. He, I mean, a literally a twitch. If you've ever truly yipped it, you would know. Like it's, it's different. It's. It is different. When you see it, you know it, or when you feel it, yeah. you know it. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about uh, what you're doing now in your life. Uh, it sounds like you, you're you playing. You no, know, are you competitive these days? I still play some. Uh, you know, I play on the Legends Tour, and we have a handful of tournaments. But what I'm doing now is um, I'm doing brain balancing, and it's a it's a very specific type of brain balancing that I did in 2019. Um, I'd struggled with the yips for almost 20 years, and I got in an LPJ event that I just really wanted to play in, but I hadn't played in an LPJ event for like seven years, and but and my yips were bad, and so a friend had told me you should try this brain balancing. And I did, um, and I played in the tournament a week and a half later, and I didn't have the yips, and I birdied five straight holes on the second day, um, and I it just it was it was life changing. Like I wish I had done it back when I first got them, and not you know had to struggle with them all those years. Um, and so then in 2020, when COVID happened, I had sort of been thinking about like, what do I want to do next? Because, you know, I just, I can't, I, I don't play as much anymore and it just, I needed something else. And I'd been toying with the thought of it, this brain balancing is called Cereset, C-E-R-E-S-E-T. So when, when COVID happened and everything was canceled, I, I just decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to go through the education and I'm going to open a franchise of this brain balancing business. And so that's what I did. I opened it in 2022 and it's not really just, it's, I mean, it really does help golf. Um, it helped all, all of the things that I worked on throughout the years of trying to teach my brain to calm down and convince myself I'm not nervous when I am all of those things just became so much easier when my brain was actually in a good place. Um, but it, can you, can you talk more specifically about what so, 
what it is and what is the goal of it? Typical brain balancing is neurofeedback, where you're trying to train your brain to do something. This brain balancing, what we do is we put sensors on your head, we read what's going on, and then they've applied musical tones to all these different frequencies, and we play them back to you in real time, and your brain recognizes those tones as itself and tries to fix itself. So people who deal with mood things like anxiety or depression, those are probably the most fun for me to to work with because they have such an aha moment when when anxiety goes away it's like this is what normal feels like yeah this is what normal feels like if there is normal Um, but it can also help like brain fog and energy levels we've helped a lot of people with long covid get their brains back into shape and and even get taste and smell back Uh, people with trauma ptsd concussions it's it's pretty amazing Uh, is there therapy associated with it is it is it it's it sounds like it's it's non-invasive your brain drives the process and there is no therapy involved it's it's actually we like people to have done their therapy and just want to move forward when they do siraset um almost like yeah exactly that and you can fall asleep during the session and it still works. It's, it's amazing. Well, so, so, and where, where, where are you, where is your My franchise, franchise located? is in Vienna, Virginia. Uh, but there's franchises okay. all over the country, um, mostly out West, but there's, you know, there's getting to be more and more offices around, uh, around the country. Yeah, I feel like there's definitely, a, uh, I don't know if I'd, I, I guess I would, I'd put it this into almost this mindfulness wave of yeah. mental health that we, I mean, almost all of us struggle to be present, right? That's kind of that, that idea of trying to be yep. here now. Along those lines, and this will be the last question I have for you. For a lot of us amateurs that aren't professional golfers that want to perform well, and struggle getting on that first tee and hitting that first tee shot. I'm sure you've had a few first tee shots in your life that, that, that I'll just tell you a real quick story. I was playing in my first state amateur here in Minnesota at, uh, where was it at? At Rush Creek. I'm not uh, yeah, sure if you're familiar yeah. with Rush Creek. And I put the tee in the ground and I, I almost, I yeah. literally almost fell over. Yeah. That's how nervous I was. And my first drive went, I teed off 10. And I was lucky I teed off 10 because I hit my ball 45 degrees left into the nine fairway and it was a par five. So it was <laughs> fine. But what, what advice would you give to us that don't play enough to really deal with those nerves regularly, which I would imagine is one of the keys is to put yourself in those yeah. situations a lot. What would you, what would well, you tell? First of all, give there? yourself permission. You're supposed to feel nervous. You know, it's the first tee and you're supposed to feel nervous. You know, excited is probably a little bit better. You kind of want that happy medium. Um, But this is where having a really good routine comes in, where you fall back on that. You fall back on the process, let go of the outcomes and, and just slow down that routine. When you're feeling nervous, just kind of slow it down and you're probably going to be going in real time. Um, but yeah, that's being able to just count on a good consistent routine can really help those times where you get stressed. Uh, like I said, I thank you so much for the conversation. It's, it's, it's fun to have, like I said, and it's unfortunate as time goes, yeah. The historical figures kind of fall into the stereotypes of them. And this is probably the only book on Mr. Hogan that doesn't overly emphasize the stereotypes and actually peels the curtain back and shares, shares insight into a man. No one really got to know, not many people anyway, and probably one of the, well, I mean, I would call him one of the fathers of golf for sure. And- well, I'm glad you liked it. And I, that was what I wanted. I wanted people to get a chance to see the side of him that I, I was able to see because it was really something special. 
Well, there you have it. That was a fun interview for me. It's a great book. If you guys are interested in purchasing it, use the link down in the description and Chris will sign the book for you. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll catch you next time.